After its humble origins on the PlayStation Portable, where Dissidia Final Fantasy was created to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Final Fantasy franchise, we now find ourselves with another Dissidia game in our hands called Dissidia Final Fantasy NT. Except this time around, it's actually been created to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Final Fantasy, and after much fanfare, it's moved away from handheld devices to finally arrive on the PlayStation 4. But is it actually any good? I mean, that's why you're all here, right? Well, never fear, because I'm going to be sticking to my customary review format, which means this video is going to be split into four clearly defined chunks relating to the game's story, its gameplay, presentation, and its lasting appeal. Feel free to skip between the sections at your leisure, but as always, I'd recommend that you listen all the way through to ensure that you get the full flavour of my experiences with a game since its release. Also, for those of you who are rather particular about wanting to avoid uncalled for surprises relating to stories, fear not, as I will be keeping this review predominantly spoiler free. I mean, in the case of this particular game, it isn't actually that hard to do so, but I just wanted to let you guys know anyway. If that's not good enough for you though, then feel free to come back and check out the review after you've collected enough memoria to view the story for yourself. Anyway, that's enough of the preamble. The Cydia NT is out, and I'm about to review the heck out of it. So grab a nice beverage, sit back and relax. Oh, and if you enjoy the review, be sure to give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and let us know how you're getting on with the game in the comments. Now, despite the original two Dissidia titles featuring stories that were part of the core experience and were of a pretty decent size, the creators of Dissidia NT were pretty upfront about the fact that while there would be a story in the newest installment into the franchise, it would be rather different from what had come before. And they weren't bluffing, as I'd say that their assertions were very true on numerous fronts. Despite this warning though, I was still pretty excited as they revealed that Kazushige Najima, the legendary scenario writer, who helped pull together the narratives on classics such as Final Fantasy 7, 8 and 10 would be in charge of creating the scenario. And for this particular scenario, Najima decided that the City NT should act as something of a reset for the overarching story. So while it does act as a continuation of the story that we saw in Dissidia and Dissidia Duodecim, it now takes place long into the future and there are now two new gods called Materia and Spiritus who have summoned the warriors into their world. As we saw before, these warriors sit on opposite sides of the fence. The warriors who we would classify as protagonists are with Materia, and the warriors who oppose them in their traditional games are with Spiritus. As the story progresses, there's a primary focus around Materia's warriors as they venture out into the world looking to understand more about where they've been summoned to and why they've been summoned before working together in order to defeat an unexpected foe. To be rather blunt though, if you're looking for a story with any real substance, you are probably going to be quite disappointed. Now, I would say that the previous two Dissidia titles didn't exactly have the most riveting of narratives either, and they certainly don't hold a candle to the classic main series Final Fantasy titles, but I think Dissidia NT really takes the biscuit in this regard. Yes, they did try to set low expectations around the story before the game launched, but even with that in mind, I still feel as though there's just a general lack of development when looking at it from pretty much every perspective. But let's start off with how it's actually presented to you. Despite residing in its own mode, the story actually has dependencies elsewhere, as it's only possible to progress with the story if you have enough memoria, a currency that can only really be acquired from performing well in the online or gauntlet modes. It means that there's a constant back and forth between the modes where you will watch one or two cutscenes then go and grind to get some memoria before coming back to watch one or two more cutscenes. It only serves one purpose, to pad the story out as much as possible because it's just so short. Another bugbear is just the general consistency of the story itself and how it progresses. After a few cutscenes towards the beginning of the story, you're presented with a branching story where each branch focuses on a different group of characters. How you progress though is entirely up to you, as each of these branches can progress independent from one another. At one point I was trying to progress them all evenly, but then I changed my approach and decided to just focus on finishing them one at a time. But then that opened up another can of worms. Once the branches are finished, they then converge, but it's possible to view the convergence cutscene without actually finishing both branches. It meant that one of the sequences I ended up watching was up to date from the perspective of one group, but not the other. So I basically ended up spoiling the incomplete branch for myself. 
Due to this approach, it also means that you have to try and piece the story together yourself as the different groups learn different things at different times. So depending on which branch you decide to view, you'll end up learning things that mean the other branches actually make more sense. But of course you didn't know that when you first watched them. I mean, it's not exactly the most taxing story and it is all rather basic, but it could have been told a lot better than it was. This approach also means that a lot of the characters just get pretty shafted, especially with the villains. Although there's plenty of screen time for Exdeath, Sephiroth and Kefka, other characters like Gold Bears and Cloud of Darkness don't really get a look in at all. And part of this is due to how they're all paired with and against each other, but it's also an issue with the writing in general. It's rare that characters actually have a chance to show some personality and shine, and I'd say the only time the story truly excelled executionally was during a parlay between Ultima Sia and Shantoto. It was a genuine joy to watch, and I felt myself getting really sucked into the exchange because it was just so good, but it only happened that once. The rest of the time when viewing story sequences, especially with sequences involving Noctis, the Warrior of Light and Cecil, the whole thing just felt pretty awkward and kind of forced. Perhaps the most unique and interesting part of the story mode isn't actually the story itself, it's instead the summon battles that reside within it. They're a real change of pace from everything else the game has to offer, but they also aren't without their issues. From a balancing perspective, there's just a general lack of consistency, as some of them are ridiculously easy, while others are rather punishing. Leviathan and Ramu are particularly mean, but not to the point where it's unfair, you just have to practice. It's more that the difficulty of those two fights is so vastly different from anything else in the game that it's just rather alarming. It could have also been quite cool if they chose to expand this out and had handicapped fights against souped up antagonists in addition to the summon battles. I mean, from the cutscenes we often see that the protagonists aren't strong enough to tackle them one by one anyway, so having something like this would have been quite cool. Honestly though, I could probably continue talking about the story for quite a long time because, as you can probably tell, I wasn't all that impressed by it. But I also have to appreciate that it wasn't a massive focus for them, so I'm going to cut them some slack and move on to the gameplay. This, unlike the story, was very much a focus for the development team, and Takeo Kujiraoka, who directed Dissidia NT, had a clear vision for a Dissidia game with 3v3 combat. This obviously represented a massive change from the previous games, which were of course 1v1, and I'd say that now I've spent some quality time with NT, the implementation is pretty good. There's a wide variety of characters to choose from, and they're all classified into four different classes. Vanguards are the brawlers who like to get up close and personal, characters like Cloud, Sephiroth and the Warrior of Light. Assassins are much quicker and nimble and have high speed attacks, and in this grouping we have characters like Noctis, Lightning and Kane. Then there's the Marksmen, who primarily rely on ranged attacks, either magical or physical, and so this relates to characters like Ace, Shantoto and Yostola. And lastly, there's the specialists who have more unique battle traits that aren't consistent with each other. And this is for characters like Vaughn and Ramza. It means that no matter what your playstyle is, there's bound to be a character that suits you. And I'm imploring all of you to try as many as you can. The story and the story gauntlets very much favor experimentation with the protagonists, but be sure to check out the antagonists too when you get the chance. I've personally been enjoying playing as Cloud and Ace, but I know they also aren't everyone's cup of tea. In terms of strategy, there's supposed to be a loose rule of thumb where specialists are somewhat independent, but assassins are supposed to be strong against marksmen, marksmen are supposed to be strong against vanguards, and vanguards are supposed to be strong against assassins. I can't say I saw too much evidence of that, but I'm sure it's there in some shape or form. Either way, I'm pretty certain that once people start settling down and taking the game more seriously, character selection will form a natural hierarchy once tiers are decided and the selection of who you fight in battles will become much more strategic. For that to happen though, they really need to allow teams to actually be able to change their character selections once they find a party, as opposed to having them locked in before they're matched up with the compatriots. In terms of the class system, I feel the only thing that's really lacking here is actually an extra class. They could have probably benefited from having some characters who were more defensive or supportive in their nature in order to help balance things up and make fights more interesting. It could have helped to make them longer with more twists and turns, as this type of character can really help to turn the tide. But I can also understand why they felt the need to make all of the characters offensive, as they clearly wanted to make sure that every single character they represented was done so as the badasses that they are in the game. Still, I think it would have added an extra dimension to proceedings. Anyway, I could go on to explain the whole bravery and HP system, but that's been around for ages now and it's pretty straightforward, so I feel that would be a bit of a waste of time. 
Instead, I'm just going to say that I've really enjoyed the gameplay experience so far. I'm enjoying the general variety that comes with the different characters, and yes, sure there are certain characters who I've enjoyed playing as more than others, but I think that's always going to be the case with games like this, especially when there are so many different styles. I'll admit, I did have some reservations around the focus towards 3v3 when it was first announced, but now that I've got used to it, I feel as though it's been a positive move. It helps to make things more strategic in terms of how you play, how you focus, and it gives the game some form of camaraderie. I do, however, still think they should add in options for ranked 1v1 and 2v2 online as well, but that's a conversation for another day. Another aspect I've enjoyed is the fresh implementation of EX skills. Outside of the unique character skills, there are just way more than I was expecting, and due to this variety, they definitely help to give players a bit more personality when it comes to planning out their approach. The only thing that really disappointed me in this area are some of the character movesets in the shielding mechanic. Titus, for example, just feels kind of limited, as although there are some variations with his dash moves, his bravery attacks in general just feel a bit lacklustre to me. It's more of a minor gripe though, because honestly, considering how long matches actually last, it doesn't feel all that restrictive in the grand scheme of things. Perhaps they could have also given you the option to choose two HP attacks instead of one, so that at least you had some options, but I'm sure there's a good reason for why they didn't. Moving on to the game's presentation, we're going to kick things off with the graphics, as this is an aspect we've been acutely aware of for some time thanks to Dissidia Final Fantasy Arcade. Through the various trailers that have been released over the past year or so, we've been able to see how faithfully each of the characters has been recreated in gorgeous HD graphics, and I've been impressed by the number of options available in terms of character skins and weaponry. I'd also like to point out how cool each of the different stages look, especially Alexandria and Rabanasta. I've also got a massive soft spot for the Promised Meadow. The transition from the void to the flowery fields gets me every single time. What I've been most impressed by though, is that when you throw in the summons and the general effects relating to moves, the game still runs so smoothly, even when things get rather intense with the visual stimulus being presented. Honestly, sometimes there is so much going on, it's genuinely hard to keep up, and you can just get distracted by the whole orgy of bright lights, but the game just keeps on trucking no matter what is going on at any given time. And I feel as though the guys over at Team Ninja should really be commended for their work in allowing that to be possible. I'd also like to give a shout out to Takahara Ishimoto. People that know me know that I really appreciate his work, and he's returned to compose music for the third Dissidia game. One of his principal tasks is to rearrange classic pieces, and I'd say that even though he's had to work on some of these pieces multiple times now, they're still pretty damn good. I've loved listening to his new takes on classic pieces of music like Rebel Army from Final Fantasy 2 and Fight with Seymour from Final Fantasy X, even if Seymour isn't in the game yet. But there's also the original pieces too, like Massive Explosion, which only help to add to the overall feeling of the game. I think the voice acting was decent, but it probably wasn't as good as it could have been, and it therefore felt somewhat underwhelming to me. I don't know if it was just short time frames that forced them to rush recordings, or just the general direction that the actors received, but something just felt a little bit off about it. Perhaps it's just me sitting here with my nostalgia goggles on, but some of the characters didn't quite sound how I remembered them, and I think part of that is probably just down to the length of time they spent away from these characters. I mean, we saw it with John DiMaggio trying to do Wacker's voice again in the Final Fantasy X audio drama. People's voices change, and sometimes it's hard for them to bring characters back to life after just such a long period of time away from them. Either way, I know it's a minor thing in the grand scheme of things, but I'd probably say that this aspect of the game's audio and visual presentation was the least on point. From the perspective of wider presentation though, well, I feel like I need to include the game's interfaces and the general experience online, which feels a bit basic. Perhaps it's just inexperience on the part of Square Enix and Team Ninja, but there's just so much more that could have been done to make the online experience way more engaging. I've seen some jokes online about how you spend much more time in the matchmaking than you do in actual matches, but sadly, it's true. I genuinely hope that they're able to work on this in the months that follow the game's launch, because it's one of the biggest barriers to the game right now. The gameplay is fun, but having to wait so long between matches with very little going on, it's just a bit of a buzzkill, especially when they only last around 2 minutes on average. Which brings us on to our final section, Lasting Appeal. 
As mentioned earlier, outside of the story mode, which is pretty limited in itself, the only other options available are gauntlet, custom matches and online. Gauntlet is where most of us will start as you get to square off against bronze level AI to practice things out, but even that seems a little bare when you first start as there's only one option available, basic, which can either be played in traditional format or core battle. Here you select a team and take part in 6 consecutive battles that get progressively harder should you wish. It's very much no frills. Once you progress through the story a bit though, you unlock some story gauntlets which are pretty much the same but with restrictions based on the story branch that they were related to. For example, there's one gauntlet where you can only choose to play as Cloud and Bart, and there's another one where you can only choose to play as your Stola and your Knight and Vaughn. Again, it's pretty bland, but at least it does offer some variety and helps you get more familiar with certain characters. Then there's the online mode, which allows you to play ranked in either the solo queue or the party queue. And there's custom lobbies where you can choose between ad hoc setups like 1v1, 2v2 or handicap matches, but in an unranked setting. Now it's not the most detailed list of options and modes, but then again, that isn't exactly necessary as long as the experience itself is smooth and there's consistent change to keep you wanting more. It's just that right now, that's where the game is somewhat prohibitive. As mentioned, the online experience isn't the most fluid, and the offline experience is really only there to help you obtain the game's unlockables faster through quicker acquisition of gear and treasure boxes. It's therefore a bit difficult at the moment to see what the lasting appeal of the City NT actually is. They could have easily added in a better ranking system or rewards to help ego bait players a bit more, but it's all quite primitive at the moment. And I really hope that there's a community that forms around the game and keeps it active until the post-launch roadmap really starts to kick in with full force. But right now in today's landscape of gaming, it doesn't feel as though there's that much to keep people's attention once the launch hype dies down. Either way, although there are issues, the City NT does have plenty of positives and I've been enjoying it so far. I'm also just glad to see the franchise finally playable on the PlayStation 4 with integrated online play. It might struggle to make it as an eSport, but Square Enix are still very much learning in that regard. And if we've learned anything from Final Fantasy XIV and Final Fantasy XV, it's that Square Enix are more than happy to try and improve experiences after they launch, if they feel there's enough merit in doing so. And with the City Rent I think the framework that's there is more than good enough for them to consider continual improvement. And that's the end of my review. Thanks to everyone who made it this far, I appreciate it's been something of a mixed bag here but I've tried to keep it as constructive as possible. Either way, be sure to let us know in the comments below how you've been feeling about the City NT. Have you been enjoying it so far or do you feel there's room for improvement? And if you enjoyed this review, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Be sure to also check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash ffunion. These guys you're seeing now are all backers of the channel and we are super appreciative of all of the support they offer. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I will see you all next time for more Final Fantasy videos.